Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Kristen Kambenzi. Here. Glenn Sarka. James Hewitt? Here. Jennifer Cliff? Here. Jennifer Ray? Here. Cheryl Maddox Smith? Jason Zadunik? Here. All right, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. All right, motion made by Mr. Hewitt, seconded by Mrs. Cliff. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, uh, moving on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Board of Education and Sandy Knoll for hosting us tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start by inviting the Sandy Knoll principal, Mrs. Stacy Brock, to the podium, and I believe she's brought a few of her staff, staff. as well. I'll let her introduce them. Our staff can come up with you. I have Amy Pruner, my instructional coach, Emily Emendorfer, my counselor, and Mr. Bill Brazier is my third grade teacher. Come on up. <laughs> Welcome to Sandy Knoll. Um, I'm going to do a recap of what we've already been um, working on and some things we've been involved in and activities um, throughout the school year thus far. Um, let's start with this slide. So, this slide, um, educating the whole child. The definition of multi-tiered system of support that I have up there is an excerpt from our continuous improvement plan summary. So I tell the staff, I always remind the staff of what our continuous improvement goal is and what our strategic planning goals are. And I feel that the goals of your building should mirror the district goal and the goals of your Grade levels should mirror the building and the district goals. So we are all working together in a unified vision. Um, the key word in this definition is whole child. So as I go through the next few slides, um, I'll demonstrate um, what we've been working on the building to educate the whole child. First off, we had um, the first annual Sandy Noel Social Emotional First annual, I'm sorry, first annual annual SEL Family Fun Night. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Ms. Emily Emmendorfer to talk about it. She was the brains behind all of the activities. Hi, so like she said, this is our first annual social emotional learning, which is really cool because it's something we've never done in our district before. So um, it was a great way to not only the foster the home-school connection, but it provided families with an opportunity to sit down and discuss emotions, create and develop like family goals together, and then discuss real life scenarios that the kids might encounter and how they should handle those not only as a family, but as an individual in the school. So um, why SEL? Um, SEL focuses, of course, on educating the whole child, which is what Ms. Rock was just talking about. Um, it helps to improve academic performance, it helps to improve student behavior, and then it helps to decrease um, students' risk of depression and other mental illness. So it's a great thing that we're focusing on here, especially with MTSS. So thank you. So some of the ways that we focus, um, besides what Ms. Emily has talked about, how do we provide our tiered interventions for behavior? In this building, we have a building-wide behavior expectations that we have posted in the hallways. And at the beginning of the school year, we went through, um, took our classrooms, and taught students the specific expectations um, that we have posted around the building for different areas, um, such as the cafeteria, office, hallways, um, playground, all the areas that the busing. So um, we have a behavior accountability form that we use here. It's not just about um, office referrals to my office. It's about different behaviors um, in classrooms that teachers have had to address. So we keep track of all of that data. We have all that data on a spreadsheet. And when it comes to 
um, meetings and deciding if we need to um, have a intervention plan for that student, um, we can look at all of that data that we've collected um, throughout the school year to make those um, informed decisions. We also have a behavior intervention menu that we use um, for teachers to be able to access if they're having you know, certain issues in the classroom, they are able to go to that menu and try different strategies that we have listed there. Um, Ms. Emily goes into the classrooms to teach social emotional learning lessons. She does small group interventions and also individual emotional and behavior support. So she is a very busy woman here at San Diego. <laughs> we love her. <laughs> okay, the academics part of our multi-tiered system of support initiative. We use um, assessment data and classroom evidence from our classroom teachers to guide instruction, intervention groups, and grade level goals. We have PLCs, which are professional learning communities, and Mrs. Pruner will talk more about that. Um, grade level teachers meet regularly, working collaboratively to improve instruction and academic performance of students. We utilize our instructional coach, and Mrs. Pruner is our instructional coach, to support teachers through the MTSS process. She partners with our teachers, helping them to improve teaching and learning so all of our students can be more successful. So she asks the teachers, how can I help you improve your students' achievement? And I always tell my staff, what we are doing must make an impact. If we don't see a change or an impact, then we're wasting our time. Then we need to try a different strategy, do something different. It has to be meaningful. It has to make an impact on our kids. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Mrs. Pruner, our instructional coach. Oh, if anybody knows me, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so as far as um, the instructional coach position goes, you guys know this is a brand new position to our district this year. So um, it has been um, implemented through the new MTSS initiative. Um, and so in taking on this position, we also uh, began with doing professional development for the teachers. And so at the beginning of the school year, we began doing professional development in the MTSS rollout. We were part of that voice from up above giving the message to everyone else. So we began with that. Um, we also, um, I teamed with Emily and we did professional development on um, tiers of intervention for behavior. Um, we were able to kind of put, a, put together um, some documents that teachers could go to and use that would have different tiers of interventions that they could use, resources, um, things like that, and also how to document that and then how that could maybe move into a SAP meeting or um, something like that. Um, we've also um, been working on um, the fast bridge rollout. So we're piloting a new um, assessment um, program right now instead of NWEA. Well, we're doing NWEA as well, but we're also <coughs> piloting um, fast bridge and there was some learning that needed to be done with that. So we were responsible for um, helping the, the teachers um, know what that was gonna look like. Um, then moving into PLCs, um, we have been working on PLCs since the beginning of the school year. Um, we have an agenda that gets laid out. It's uh, pretty much set by the teachers. I lay it out and say, what do you want to work on? And that's where we head next. Um, this, this is, is a an first example grade. of one of the PLC agendas. <laughs> so we have our norms, and each of the norms have been picked by the teachers in that group. Um, I also have their SMART goals listed as well as our school goals so that we can, um, we can look at those um, while we're going through and deciding what we're going to be working on. Um, right now, our big push is we've been working on essential standards. So we talked a lot about how um, there's not enough time in the year to really teach all of those standards to mastery. So we're picking out those uh, standards and looking at what those um, essential standards are for each of the grade levels. Um, going across, we have all of our essential listed on the left, and then the next one is rigor. So what would it look like if a student was proficient in that area? 
The next line is any prerequisite skills, vocabulary, things like that, that um, students might need for that skill. Um, common assessments that the teachers will use to know if they have proficiency in that area. Um, when is it taught? So making sure that both or all the teachers in that grade level are on the same uh, page as far as when that's going to be taught. And then um, when they do have mastery, what are some extensions that you can do of that standard? So um, them being able to have this, I know as a new teacher to a new grade level, this would have been really helpful to me, I think. So um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, use that if there's any change up in grade levels or just, um, you know, we talk a lot about our fifth grade teachers and how they have to get through their curriculum by April um, so that they can get on to testing and they have to have all those standards met. So maybe knowing some of those essential standards and which ones they might be able to just kind of give exposure and then move on might be really helpful. So that was what we worked on there. And the then, important part, sorry, just to yeah. interrupt for a minute. The, this is a lot of work for our grade level teachers. We and started this in January, and we've still got two that are not quite there, but most of them are done at this point. And so. it's one of those things where it's how you deliver the message of the importance of doing this. So when you're talking about intervention groups, um, this is what you utilize to determine where your intervention groups need to be. So as we rolled this out to the teachers, and now when I ask them, when I hop into PLCs and I'm like, do you understand why we're doing this? Totally get it. They completely understand. So right now we're working on math. We'll go into ELA, um, it, and then we'll align it vertically by grade level to see if there's any gaps um, in between the grade levels. So um, it's a great, it's a lot of work, but it's very meaningful work. And it's been really helpful. Um, the next part of what we've been working on a lot in, um, as an instructional coach is coaching cycles. So this was something that we've been learning about and getting a lot of professional development ourselves at the beginning of the school year and now we're finally able to jump in and get our fingers wet and try some of the things that we've been learning about. So um, we currently have um, three coaching cycles going on at San Diego, junior kindergarten, kindergarten, and um, second grade. Um, I'm actually working with one of our student teachers in second grade, so that's been really fun. Um, and we've actually finished one coaching cycle in our building with third grade. Um, so what I wanted to do next is kind of take you through what that looks like, and then um, that'll be it for me. So um, as far as the coaching cycle goes, when you get started, um, you're kind of deciding what the teacher feels they need more support in and how they can support their students. So um, our, our whole vision is the student-centered coaching model. Um, and then from there, um, we decide what standards are gonna be worked on and create learning targets. Um, so just kind of making it even just smaller little goals along the way. And then from there, we take those learning targets and we are able to find some um, some uh, baseline data. So we would give either a pre-test um, or um, some way to figure out where the students are. So in this particular area, we were working on fractions and um, also um, data collection on graphs and also time. So there were a lot of different things. At the beginning of this, um, we collected data where we had 13 students that were at the emerging level, which meant the low 60th or 60 percent. One was developing, which was 60 to 74 percent. Two had met the goal of 75 to 95 percent, and we had none that were exceeding the expectation as far as that standard went. So that meant 12 percent of the students were able to demonstrate proficiency in these areas that we were looking for. So that was our pre-test. And then um, from there, we got together, we co-planned. Um, we were able to um, talk about different research-based strategies that could be used, um, things like that. We even co-taught a um, lesson together on some of the things that the students were struggling with. And then we were able to take the end of unit assessment. And from there, we had only one in the emerging level one was developing, eight met the expectation of 70% and then, um, or 75%, and then we had 
seven that were exceeding the expectations. So we had gone from 12% proficient to 88% proficient. And then what was really nice is we were able to get together and talk again about, um, okay, so we had a pretty good showing as far as um, our students that were proficient, but what are we gonna do about those kids that still aren't getting it? Having a conversation about that, where can we still hit them? Let's focus on them in small group. Oh, some of them are title students too, so that makes a little bit of sense. We can get some extra instruction there, and um, that was pretty much where we um, ended the cycle. Um, it was a seven-week cycle, um, and it just followed the unit that they were working on in math. So, and then there is interest in doing another cycle. So, um, the, the teacher had shown that it was something that was working for them, and. Um, yeah, so um, the only thing I would say is just continued support as far as professional development because we are still learning um, professional development for the teachers, the aides, admin, all of that would be really helpful, so thanks. And I think um, you're an instructional coach's plan, professional development, but you can also add building specific things to your PD. And the staff, the staff here has taken a lot of risks and done a lot of new things that they've never tried before, so I'm super proud of them. We created a staff shout out board in the hallway. Um, everyone deserves a shout out in this building, absolutely. We have a lot of great things happening. Um, we have a Pineapple PD bulletin board that um, Amy and I put up. It's for staff to be able to have the opportunity to visit each other's classrooms to see what exciting things that they are doing. So it gives them like a time slot. This is when I'm teaching this. Can I get coverage so I can go watch my colleagues? So that's some very exciting things that we have. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Emily. All right, so get, getting to the physical um, health wellness part. We are um, partnering, I'm partnering with um, Kelly Sager from Marisa and the University of Michigan. Um, it's a program called Impact Michigan. Um, it, is, it is stands for Interrupting Prolonged Sitting with Activity. A lot of my teachers already implement a lot of movement breaks throughout the day in their classrooms. So this again is just a way to, it's research based, providing five four minute activity breaks throughout the day. Um, research, research shows it improves time on task, improves memory recall, improves problem solving reasoning skills, helps students take in new information, and there's a 6% 6 increase in standardized test scores and an increase in student achievement overall. So Kelly's dropping off some more information and then we'll sign an agreement um, and we will start the two year process of um, delivering this in the school. So I'll have a liaison for the building. Um, and it's about how you arrange your classroom, how much space you give your kids. There's a lot of thoughtfulness that goes into planning your room to provide for these movement breaks and at what level the movement breaks need to be, like how much activity the kids need to have for that impact to happen um, in their brains. So that's very exciting. After school activities that we host at Sandy Knoll, we have an art club that is run by Barbara Hillier. We will be having um, a Sandy Knoll track team. We have a Spanish club for fourth and fifth graders that we've had um, since the beginning of the school year. Um, next fall, we will be starting um, collaborating with NMU and starting a Start Fit, Stay Fit in the fall of 2023. Um, Mrs. Jersey, her fifth graders, did a three-week unit with Gabby um, from Marisa, and Gabby is really amazing. Um, they did coding, math computations, robotics. They worked with four robots, and I had a lot of interest from parents um, in having an elementary robotics club. So hopefully we can get that going um, next year. Family engagement, the school family connection. We have a Sandy Knoll Facebook page, our Sandy Knoll School Association fa Facebook page. I send home um, monthly Sandy Knoll family newsletters with important dates for that entire month along with information from the school. So every month that goes out the first day of the month. Um, that's much appreciated from the feedback I've gotten from parents. They say they refer back to that calendar for the month often. Our Sandy Knoll School Association is the absolute best thing ever. 
They do a lot of fundraisers, they support student activities, they support our teachers with mini grants. Um, I also provide childcare. We have some Marquette Senior High School students who volunteer every month um, to oversee childcare for families so we can get more families to be able to come to the meetings. So that's been great. Um, family activity nights, we had our first one this year. And then, you know, parent-teacher conferences, parent volunteers, and even grandparent volunteers that we have in the building. So we have a lot going on. How we connect to our community. We did Rock the Socks. We had the Sandy Knoll you know, Book Drive. Um, Anna Dravelin did a Bundle Up Marquette where she did a clothing drive and then hung the clothes on her fence here at Sandy Knoll. And people from the community were able to come and get some clothing. We did the TV6 Canathon. Our fifth graders completely ran that whole process. Um, the MAPS Education Foundation and Incredible Bank partnered for our first grade, um, the Piggy Banks, that program. We raised over $1,340 on Spread Goodness Day for Start the Cycle. So they came here, the program director, and we presented that money to them so they could buy equipment and, and whatnot for that program in the community. Um, Jacqueline Wagner um, had a children's art exhibit at Peter White Public Library. So that I showed the new kiln that we have um, and some of the things that the kids have made utilizing our new kiln. Um, we did a fifth annual Sandy Knoll um, Toys for Tots. Um, this fall, we did uh, Make a Difference Day. We partnered with NMU Swim and Dive Team to break our playground. So that was fun. We visit um, the Regional History Center in Marquette. I got to be a part of that with the third grade. Um, that was very hands-on, interactive. The kids had a blast. We have had many safety presentations from the Marquette City Police and local fire department. We spend a lot of time collaborating with Northern. Um, we have education majors that do their observation hours here. Um, we had a sorority that volunteered their time in December helping students make their crafts and projects for Christmas. Um, I try to collaborate with NMU whenever I can. Try to get extra people to help in the building, volunteers, and they have to do a lot of community service as well, so if we pair together, we can get a lot done together. We have young authors also that will be coming up this spring. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic over to Mr. Brazier because we have not only connected to our community locally, but we have connected internationally with friends in Japan. So there's a sister city uh, relationship between Marquette and, and a city in central Japan since 1978. And on and off, we've been, uh, Whitman Elementary and Son Elementary have been partners. Now we're partnering up with an elementary school with a sixth grade group because they teach English aggressively in sixth grade. So we've been connecting back and forth with a sixth grade class, we have third grade and sixth grade. And we've, uh, you can see there we have uh, introduction videos and videos actually answering the question of each body of students. Uh, the students in Japan wanted to know what our life was like here in Marquette. So we did, um, with uh, Gabby and Marisa, we did a uh, project where we actually did... Um, so this is where we asked the questions. And we just went through and... This is my class. Drums in that particular school. 
the only school in that district that has such program, and they actually did a, a practice for us. So my kids love that. They just thought that was, that was really, yeah, that was, that was a treat. They want to see it again tomorrow. So. <laughs> and then our video to reciprocate to them shows, uh, we did a, a jam board with Gabby to another part of Japan. We used that to piggyback that to telling them our favorite things about our students, where their favorite places in Marquetta. And we embedded the video right into the jam board that they got to talk about. It. puts on. Um, the kids did a mock Macy's Day Parade, um, all kinds of fun activities. We had a sled dog race um, in the parking lot. Even though they were canceled locally, we had our own, so that was fun. And this is a big one. I'll talk about it. There'll be much more to come about this. Um, collaborating with our Child Central Station and Outdoor Learning Space. So we received um, some grant money, Amy Ahala, our um, before and after school director, um, received some grant money, so we are working collaboratively to design um, and put in an outdoor learning space at the school. So we're very excited about drawing up the plans for that. I have a committee that consists of a few parents, a grandparent, um, a teacher representative, myself, Amy, um, and then we'll be having others join as we move forward with this project. So, and that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brock, and to your staff as well. That was wonderful. Mrs. Johnson, our special ed director, if you want to join me over at the podium, I gotta get the mic and I'll get set up. things are never close enough so I apologize it feels like it's a long ways away I hope to fix it up okay all right so last board meeting we heard from Dr. Greg Nian from Marisa who presented information regarding a millage that is on the May 2nd ballot and that millage would be uh, would impact voters in both Marquette and Elger counties, the 13 or actually the 12 
public school districts and the one public school academy, that being North Star, that are within the reach of Marisa. I thought this meeting, it might be helpful to follow up Dr. Nian's presentation with some more map specific information regarding that millage. That millage is for special education funding and we'll talk a little bit more about what you look for. So this is, uh, I borrowed a couple slides from Marisa. Here are the basics and even a QR code where you can go to find out more information. The millage again is going to be on the ballot for May 2nd. So 20 year millage will raise about $4.8 million and uh, will last for, I said 20 years, 1.5 mills will have a great impact on all the school districts within Marisa. And that is in regards to not just special ed, but as you see over in the right, also our general funds. Since if special ed were to be more appropriately funded, we would be able to be, we'd have more flexibility, more autonomy for addressing various other non-special ed costs such as facilities, mental health supports, safety and infrastructure, extracurricular activities, and other programming. Currently, within the 13 districts that I mentioned, the 12 districts and one academy, there's about a $5 million shortfall in special education. Again, this millage would bring us almost to 100% funding. That would be 1.5 mills, and I'm happy to explain that at another time, what a mill means, how much that's gonna cost for the next 20 years. Here's a little bit more of a breakdown. In Marisa, there are approximately 9,000 students. Uh, at MAPS, to, to put it in reference, we have about 3,200 students. So over a third of the students in the entire RISA belong to market area public schools. In the RISA, approximately 1,600 students with disabilities. At MAPS, there's about 575, roughly a third. So keep that in mind, about a third of the overall student population, including those with disabilities. I listed a little bit more of a breakdown. Again, this was coming from Marisa on the, where that $5 million shortfall is coming from. And much of that shortfall is a result of the <coughs> resources that are in place for special education, especially the teachers, therapists, consultants, secretaries, administrators, paraprofessionals, drivers, we could go on and on. Ms. Johnson, our special ed director, who's going to speak shortly, can give you, will be providing a little bit more specific information on some of that staffing. Also, the costs for special ed include those related to transportation. Over 200,000 miles are traveled annually to transport students uh, with disabilities. And then, of course, supplies, equipment, travel, professional development, and other fees. This is a more specific, this, this particular slide, uh, thank you to Mr. Lampton and our folks from the finance department, a breakdown of costs at Market Area Public Schools, roughly five years of data, and I'm not sure if you can see it very well from where you're sitting, but generally, if you look at the red, the red is the difference between the gray and the green. The gray is expenses, the, the green is revenue, and the red is the shortfall, roughly two and a half million dollars a year that we experience as a shortfall in special education funding. Thus, my reason for piggybacking on Dr. Nian's presentation where he discusses the cost or the shortfall overall throughout the visa and the importance of that special ed millage. I'm going to ask Ms. Johnson to come up next and speak a little bit more about trends in special education. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Patrick, and thank you to the Lord and community members who came out today um, to meet with us. Um, so some trends in special education. The next few slides I'm going to show um, over the last five years that we've seen an increase in our area at Market Air Public Schools of students who with special needs um, in our school district. So you'll see that there's been an increase over time. Um, our fall 2017 count, you can see up on the top in parentheses, you'll see that we had four, um, 504 students total um, of students in 2017 who had IEPs in the market area public school. And if you look at the bottom, um, the percentage, we had a report that was 14.88% of all MAPS students 
who were receiving special education services um, in the fall of 2017. So the next few slides I'll show you are data from each of our fall counts. Um, this is our data from fall 2018. You can see there's a you know, a slight increase again in the total number of students, and then the percentage goes up to 15.01%. So I'm going to go through these slides and just kind of show you that there's a trend in over the last five years that we are servicing students um, more so in, in special education. So in 2019, we had about 15.41% of all of our MAP students um, re receiving special ed services. 2020, it was at 15.48%. In 21, we had 15.83% um, of our students getting special ed services. And then our current fall count of this fall, we were at 17 points, I think that's a five or eight <laughs> percent. So you can see that there's been an increase over the last five years in students in our market area public schools who are receiving um, special ed services. So we try to be proactive. So what did we do? We saw this trend, we knew it was occurring over time, and so as a district we had to sit down and think, what can we do to support these students in this increase in numbers, and how can we support them best in our Kettner Public Schools? I'll talk a little bit about that here. So what did we do um, to help address the increase in students that we were servicing? One thing, and you see in the know, thank you so much. They talk quite a bit about MTSS and the specifics. I'm just going to speak very um, generally about MTSS. So we did, in Market Air Public Schools, decide to partner with Marisa. So thank you to Marisa on our MTSS partnership um, to really implement the multi-tier system of supports here in our district. Um, and so the three big ideas for MTSS are really using assessments, progress monitoring tools. We talked a little bit about um, San Diego with FastBridge and using assessment tools to find out where is the student? Where are they ready to learn? What is their instructional level and what are they ready to learn? So using assessments is very important in MTSS. And then number two is, okay, so now we have this data. Um, what are some effective research-based practices that we can use to provide instruction for all students um, and or intervention for those students who need intervention? And then the next big idea for MTSS is um, to go ahead and collaborate in teams. And again, Stanley Knoll, thank you. You did a great job talking about all those different meetings that you have your professional learning communities and how regularly you get together. To get together in those teams, use that data that you have from your assessments to make instructional decisions. Where is that child and how can we help them? So that's a huge part of how we're addressing um, the students' needs in our district. Here's a different visual for MTSS. I like to look at this one as well. Um, so MTS is important because it's a pathway um, out of special education. So we saw an increase in students who need special needs. What can we do to be preventative, proactive? How can we support some of these students early on in the tiers of intervention? Um, and maybe perhaps they might not need specialized instruction through an IEP. So, or if they do already have an IEP for specialized instruction, maybe it's their way to meet and achieve their IEP goals and perhaps um, no longer need that level of support. So if you look at this visual, you can see that MTSS addresses academics and behavior. Um, the first category with 80%, our goal is to have about 80% of students um, who can do well and be successful at the tier one level. And what does that mean? Um, we're all other students, about 80% of our students. Things like universal supports in the classroom, things like they were talking here at San Diego with their social emotional learning happening in the classroom for you know, those lessons that um, Miss Emily is coming into the classroom and doing. Those are great examples of universal instruction. Then using the data that we're going to use as part of MTSS is looking at those students and saying, okay, which students um, need extra support? And then going through and deciding um, what type of supports do they need and how can we provide that support, maybe in a small group setting. And then again, about 5% of our students um, but probably at that point need maybe intensive instruction. Maybe they need a different level of support, um, either behavior or academic. Um, and that's really what our goal as a district is to really implement MTSS so we can meet the need of all students wherever they are in, in their needs and level of need. Um, some really neat things that we've done over the last two years. Um, this is only my second year in this position and I'm excited to say all these wonderful things that we've implemented so far. Um, so, as you know, every spring, all of our LEAs in the area have a preschool screen. It's a great um, partnership with Marisa, CAM, Great Start Readiness programs, um, our local health departments, and it's a really big preschool screening every spring um, that we do every year. 
I noticed when I came on in the previous, because I was um, a teacher in this standing all actually, <laughs> in other districts, so I was a teacher here too, and I noticed you know, what, what can we do to really get that early identification? Yes, we have the preschool screening in the spring. That is fantastic and wonderful. But as you saw earlier in my slides, was we're seeing an increase in these kids who need specialized instruction or going to IEPs. So how can we be proactive and how can we support these kids and have early identification for these students? So I collaborated with Head Start, so thank you to Head Start. Um, we collaborated and worked really, really closely the last two years on actually doing a winter screening. So here at Marquette Public Schools, we actually did winter screenings last winter, my first year here, and then again this winter to find those students early on so we can get them services sooner than later, right? It's better for everyone if we can identify those students and their needs early on, and then we can go ahead and provide those services, um, you know, through the IEP and um, the little ones, um, the three and four year olds. So we did that twice this year, so that was a really great thing I thought that we did here at Marquette Public Schools to help identify those um, little ones early on. Another great thing that we've done in just this year specifically, so ECSC, ECSC is our programming um, students who have um, early on um, services through special education. They're typically our three, four, maybe five year olds. Um, so some changes that we made this year. We were able to put two um, special education consultants into our classrooms. So these two special education consultants are our ECSC teachers who actually worked with these ECSC kids last school year. So we put them right into the classrooms this school year to help those ECSC students from last year transition back into you know, a junior kindergarten or kindergarten classroom because obviously that setting is, you know, there are more students, there's more um, expectations. So we were able to put two of our um, consultants into those classrooms to help support the teachers, the aides, and the students themselves as they transition to junior kindergarten or kindergarten. So that was new this year, that's pretty exciting. Um, also at ECSC, over the last two years, we made some changes. Um, we got new curriculum materials, research-based evidence-based curriculum materials to go along with MTSS. So we were able to get that in place with new assessments and progress monitoring. Um, a really great thing again with Marisa is they have a partnership now where um, our ECSC teachers are meeting regularly, almost monthly, um, with Marisa's early childhood education team. And for the first time, we're bringing ECSC teachers from all over the area, all of our LEAs, and we're bringing them together at Marisa, um, and they're working together um, and getting ideas to help collaborate, not just in Marquette Air Public Schools, but with all of our local LEAs, which is, again, new this year and a fantastic addition to our special ed department. Um, and then last but not least, um, our ECSC teachers, we had a lot of professional development because we, um, we included the new curriculum, new assessments, and we're just changing things up that we went ahead and we're providing our ECSC staff with some of that PD. Um, another thing that we did this year, it's so exciting, and again, all of these things help our students um, who have special needs, who need specialized instruction through IEPs. Another thing this year, um, we have a junior kindergarten in every one of our elementary buildings, which is fantastic, so very happy to see that happen at Marquette Area Public Schools. So they do listen if you just kind of you know, <laughs> quietly say things on the side. So we got a JK in every building that's fantastic for everybody, not, for, um, not just our typically developing children, but it's great for our specialized students as well. Because what we're able to do now is um, depending on the child, especially his child and their needs and all of those types of things, we can certainly look at that and have a partnership between those junior kindergarten students. So depending on the students, we're allowed to pair, partner up and pair up um, and help some of those, you know, our junior K kids can work with their ECSA classrooms, um, they can have social interactions with one another, academic supports depending on that child's needs. So there's some, um, so there's some pairing between our typically developing peers and some of our students who are in ECSA classrooms. So again, thanks to Marquette Air Public Schools, we now have a junior kindergarten in every classroom, and we can do those types of things. All right. In the next couple of slides, you saw all the different kinds of things that we're trying to do in schools. Here I'm going to talk about things that we added. Again, we saw an increase from about 14% to about 17% in the last five years of kids with special needs. So what else did we do at Marquette Air Public Schools to help address those issues? Um, so here we have a total of um, on the side, you'll see we actually hired six and a half new special education faculty just from last fall to today. Um, and then I broke it down for you in so who, who we um, hired. So you can see we have two additional special education FSP teachers. Um, so we have two new FSP teachers that we added. We added another social worker for the special ed department, another speech, um, speech and language pathologist for the district, um, another certified OT therapist um, for the district. 
um, another special ed teacher over at Bothwell, and then the part-time secretaries for the special ed office. Um, and then that little note on the bottom, this is not part of last fall to now, but current. But you can see, since 2010 and 2011, we actually added 29 additional special education staff um, district-wide, um, and that would be like your special education um, aides. So over the last 10 plus years, we added 29 special education aides to our district to support the growing number of students in, um, that we're servicing in special education. So what does that look like in the classroom? So again, from last fall to current time, we added two FSP classrooms to our district. So before I came here, we had two FSP classrooms. We now have four. Um, the whole point of um, adding those two FSP classrooms in the last year and a half was so that we can keep the students to staff ratio low here at San Manuel. Again, remember I came from San Manuel, so um, I, I knew the, the district well, and we came up with the idea to start more FSP classes in the district to keep numbers low in our FSP classrooms. Um, the next point, so the state says that we can have up to 12 students in an FSP classroom. Our intent was to keep it below 12, um, as low as we possibly can, again, to meet the needs of all of those students that are in those classrooms. Um, so we did add those two extra FSP classrooms, and we now have four, and all four of our classes are um, operating below the allowance of 12. Um, and then our new FSP programs, so we're at Bothwell and Superior Hills. Um, also, we did add one more resource room at Bothwell Middle School. And so a total of three new classes in the year and a half. Also, we, we increased um, our special education services this year. So this year we did do, again, looking at the numbers and looking at our students um, and how many students we, you know, we need to service. We did add um, more contractual days with Marisa. We partnered with them for um, ASD consultants and behavior consultants. Um, so we did partner with them and increase that amount of service. So you'll see um, our ASD consultants and behavior consultants in throughout the district um, almost um, most of the school year. <laughs> um, we also um, were able to pilot again with Marisa, a great new program. We tried it this year, um, a new transition service program for our seniors. Um, and so what they allowed some of our seniors to do is they gave them opportunities for just additional job skills training, um, experience, and job placements. Many of those students that are participating in that pilot program are actually um, in job placements right now, getting some of those extra skills that they need. So some really great things that we're doing here. Um, also, we're having a community partnership with um, NMU School of Education. So um, we have recruitment of special education staff. We're trying to get to recruit teachers here um, as openings come up in special education. Because as you see, we hired six and a half new um, faculty in just a year and a half. So we need to um, make sure that we're properly staffed. So we have a relationship with NMU. We're, um, administrators are attending mock interviews. Um, we're guest lecturing at NMU to introduce ourselves and meet some of those future educators. Um, we're visiting NMU classrooms. And then, of course, we're welcoming any student teacher and interns here. And like Sandy Noel said, they're in here um, volunteering quite a bit. Um, we were able to hire two new special education teachers this past January. Um, they were brand new graduates, and I had worked with them and met them throughout the fall semester. So we were able to bring them on board, so that was exciting. And then we hired some um, long-term subs for some of our long-term um, leaves. And um, also professional development opportunities. Um, when we're working with students with special needs, sometimes they have unique needs and require um, different levels of support that maybe not everyone is trained in or knows how to work with. Um, so we do provide um, an annual um, training for all special education aides and teachers. It's called Handle with Care, um, and that's done with every, every special education staff member. It gets trained in that every year. Um, it helps with de-escalation and working with students who are maybe heightened um, in their behavior. Um, we also, this um, year, a new, in 2022, we have a great opportunity. Um, we did have um, all staff is able to apply for up to a $500 stipend to get professional development outside of their work day. Um, and so they're able to apply for that. And all staff, anyone from MESPA 1 or MESPA 2, um, could apply for those um, extra professional development opportunities. We also have um, something called Vector Solutions, um, where we also have many um, options for professional development. And so if anyone, if it was a snow day, and if somebody wanted to go ahead and um, still get paid for that snow day, um, and at the same time, they can certainly go ahead and they have a link um, and access to any of those trainings on, on, on Vector Solutions. So 
Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone, um, family, community, school board, um, Marquette Area Public Schools, for all of your support um, with students with special needs um, and to make you know, Marquette Area Public Schools a welcoming and nurturing place for all of our students. All right, thank you, everybody. I got to back with the other one. Good news, I'm about halfway through my superintendent report. <laughs> Just kidding. We're almost done. So, next up, kindergarten registration. Uh, we have already some promising figures. Uh, 12 uh, ECSE students and 71 JK students that are going to be rolling up. They're already mapped students. 147 new online enrollments for kindergarten putting us at a total of approximately 230 kindergartners for the fall. And that's a pretty good figure this early on in the process. Also, to, I guess a nice piggyback to what Ms. Johnson shared with not just all the, the, the supports in place, but the preschool or the pre-screening, the kindergarten screening that we are going to be providing this year uh, to go with the health screening. And that's going to be March uh, March, can you help me with the date? Second through the fifth. One Second through the fifth, one through the fourth. Okay, so we have kindergarten screening that we're bringing back for the first time in a long time. There's been a lot of conversation about kindergarten screening, readiness screening. I'm looking at Miss Pruner. She's part of a team, Miss Brock, of folks that are bringing back kindergarten screening to help families decide maybe where their, their child best belongs, that, that being in regard to whether they should be in JK or go right into kindergarten. So thank you very much for that team. That's been a long desired uh, effort or, or option for families and we're looking forward to providing that here very soon. So next, staff appreciation. Market Area Public Schools is committed to employing the highest quality professionals, appreciates the hard work and dedication of those choosing this noble profession. In light of our efforts to recruit and retain qualified staff and show our appreciation for the amazing work of our employees, I'm asking that the Board of Education consider the following measures. First, a signing bonus of $500 for any new employee hired between March 20th and June 8th of this school year who remains employed as of June 8th, that's the last day of school. Be payable on, June 4, on the June 14th payroll. Along with that, a retention bonus for those who, are, who remain employed, who were hired before March 20th and remain employed through June 8th. Next, for any new hire as of March 20th, tonight, through the end of the school year, Market Area Public Schools, I'd like to ask for your consideration that we absorb all fingerprinting fees necessary for employment. This would include fees for sub-drivers, aides, and custodians who are MAPS employees. This would not include teacher subs who are not MAPS employees. They're paid by a third party, and they work throughout the region, not just Market Area Public Schools. <coughs> In light of the lingering impacts of COVID-19, I'd like to ask for your consideration that any person employed at Market Area Public Schools as of June 8th receive one additional paid sick leave beyond those contractually due them, which would be prorated according to FTE, full-time employment, to be used for the 2023-24 school year. And then, of course, uh, we would prorate uh, based on the number of hours that they work in a day not to exceed eight hours. Ms. Johnson met, uh, mentioned the $500 stipend for professional development. That's something we delivered in October. That is still available for all staff. It's paid for with Title II funds. And I just want to remind folks that that training, that that professional development is, uh, is available for all staff outside of their working hours. I see Mr. Collins in the audience. Thank you for coming. Mr. Collins is our food service director and he's very much help, been very helpful for the next item. Uh, and that is, uh, again, for your consideration that all MAPS employees uh, receive 
free breakfast and or lunch as applicable for Mini Maps Kitchen beginning tomorrow, a little late for school breakfast or lunch right now. So starting tomorrow through the remainder of the year. And then if, if it's approved, we'll make sure to follow up with further instructions. Excuse me, I missed one. This was listed on one, on, uh, one of Mrs. Johnson's slides. The back to school kickoff, for the first time in my tenure at Market Area Public Schools, we invited all staff, all hourly and salaried staff, to our back to school kickoff in August of 2022. And this year I'll be extending that offer again to all staff for our back to school kickoff on August 29th, 2023. The theme is raising collective efficacy. That's that our shared belief that we can positively impact all students. And we're gonna be featuring uh, Ms. Jenny Donahue, an inter internationally known speaker on collective efficacy and, and somebody very well versed in implementing MTSS. So we're excited about that. And then again, uh, as part of Ms. Johnson's slide, also brand new, very recently, now that we've exceeded our six snow days, which I'm sure you're all aware of, we've actually provided an opportunity for staff, hourly staff, who would nor not normally be paid on those additional snow days to receive training online, uh, even though they can't come to work and, and work directly with kids, to receive compensation for training that they do online on those school cancellations. So that's the end of my PowerPoint. I just wanted to mention that these measures are only uh, guaranteed for this school year, but again, this is uh, our, an effort to show our gratitude uh, for, for all of you for supporting our, our, our youth, our communities, market area public schools, and partnering with us to provide the highest possible education to our students. Again, thank you to Sandy Knoll staff and Ms. Johnson for highlighting some of those wonderful things that are going on. I do have a couple other categories, and the first one is a gentleman in the back, Officer Jeff Zarni. Yep, perfect. Jeff Zarni is going to be our new SRO, School Resource Officer. We'll be taking over for the much loved and uh, Officer Todd Duran. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Or Officer Zarni, I appreciate that you're able to come here tonight, so we can put a face with the name and look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you to Market Area Public Schools. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I also want to give a shout out to Mr. Lance uh, Whitfield, who is our Kaufman director, and he's going to be resigning at the end of this month. Uh, Mr. Whitfield has been a dedicated employee for a long time, and we're very excited that uh, he's having the opportunity to move into retirement. We're also sad to see him go. We have recently hired a new Kaufman director, and I'm not going to try to say their name because <coughs> I don't remember it, nor do I remember how to pronounce it off the top of my head. It's fresh off the press. That'll be out soon. And then lastly, our very own Kristen Cambenzi is the recipient uh, from the Michigan Association of School Boards. Uh, she is a recipient, a recipient of a uh, award, let's see, so it's something very distinguished, Ms. Cambenzi. <laughs> I believe it's the level three award. Ooh. Yeah, level That's three. Yep, yeah, there it is. Level three award of distinction. What does that mean? So, what does that mean, Ms. Camden? <laughs> uh, it means I've gone to quite a bit of. Uh, oh, Sorry, quite a, quite a bit of uh, MASB classes to learn how to be a better school board member. So. You're a level three. <laughs> wow. Well done. That is all I have this evening for you. Thank you again, Maps Board of Education. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Kim Benzie. All right. Um, so do we need to do anything for the staff appreciation motion, or is that later in the agenda? Okay, so we would need to amend the agenda to add the staff appreciation under new business. 
So do I have a motion to amend the agenda? I would make a motion to agenda, uh, amend the agenda to add uh, the staff appreciation discussion in the new business. I support. All right. Uh, we have motion and support. Uh, any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So we will add that to the new business. Um, let's see. 9D. Okay. And now we're going to move on to comments from the public, agenda items only. The first one, uh, and if I mispronounce your names, I'm sorry. Uh, Lorelei Brody. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, because it said agenda item. So, do you want to go at the end then, or? Okay. Are these all going to be at the end? Very much. Uh, Shilpa. Jobalia. Jobalia. Yeah, I'm at the end. Oh. Uh, Dan Kilpala. At the end. At the end. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Gwen Storm. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Emily Richards. Okay. Uh, Lisa McBride. Okay. Um, you'll have to do it at the next meeting. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, um, you would need to talk, uh, follow the your supervisor, and then move up the chain of command. Okay, well that would be something that we could um, discuss after the meeting, okay. if that's all right. That, that's fine. I just, I just didn't understand. Okay. Yep. We'll we'll talk about it after the meeting if that's all right. Okay. Can she give general comment though? Isn't that a right of the public? She could give but, general comment. But she did not sign up ahead of time, which you have she to do at the beginning. Questions. Right. Um. So. We'll talk with her after the meeting. All right, um, approve the consent agenda. Uh, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Support. All right, uh, motion by Mr. Hewitt, support by Mr. Zajunik. <laughs> um, any comments? No? All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, board committee reports. We'll start with the board executive committee meeting of March 7th, 2023. So at executive, uh, it was myself and Ms. Kim Benzi. And uh, some of the topics we were discussing later that week, um, Superintendent Sedgwick was working on planning uh, the Spread Goodness Day events that was, uh, were to occur on March 10th. We also discussed the uh, tentative schedule. I don't believe it's been formally agreed upon yet, but the upcoming school calendar for 23-24, uh, just some kind of high level uh, dates and, and things to potentially be on the lookout for there. It also went over the safety infrastructure presentation that uh, the superintendent uh, has been presenting to a variety of service club groups uh, across the community. Uh, some of those, again, highlights from this presentation are discussing adding cameras, um, partnering with NMU um, on helping kind of the infrastructure uh, integration of that security plan. They also will do some integration with being able to have a, a centralized uh, communication between the cameras and the actual locking mechanisms for the front doors of the schools. So just improving 
the overall uh, school safety, um, you know, a lot of other smaller things too, but those are some of the largest uh, pieces of it as far as technology is concerned. We discussed the even earlier upcoming kindergarten enrollment numbers, which we just went over. So uh, great to see those uh, having a steady increase as we move along throughout the year. In addition to having the readiness screener discussion on that, um, that was pretty much all the topics covered. It was a fairly fairly short meeting for executive, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Well, okay. All right, uh, moving on to Board Appropriations Committee meeting of March 14th, 2023. All right, I'll be reporting on that one as well. Sorry to hear my voice so much, but um, in appropriations, we discussed, which you'll see later on under the new business items, we talked about food service items that uh, were coming to, I guess not for necessarily for approval, but for um, just discussion. Purchasing some new equipment for the kitchen at the high school, a new kettle, some new freezers, a large commercial grade can opener. We also, and a, there's gonna be some other items to, to come later on down the road, but they're not ready for uh, bidding yet. So, um, but again, just more improvement to the, the overall equipment for the, the school kitchen. We discussed also, the audit bid, so <clears throat> for the first time, I, I think ever, to be honest, um, Marisa had offered all of the LEAs across the two counties if we were interested in partnering with a combined audit proposal. And so they put that out to bid, and again, we'll be voting later on. There was one bidder uh, that was able to submit a proposal for perform the audit services for everybody within Marisa, and it's the recommendation to accept that bid. We also got a budget update from Mr. Lampman, and um, we'll be discussing the formal amendment at the next meeting in April, but uh, the good news is, uh, I guess, you know, again, just a lot of moving parts this year, especially with a lot of grant monies that we typically haven't encountered uh, in, in years past, so um, kind of similar to the normal December amendment we are moving, which we adopted in January. We're just kind of sliding that back a month, but so more to come on the formal budget amendment next month. I think that was it, unless Mr. Zadunik or Mr. Ray had... No, that was Thorough. Thanks. <laughs> Glad right. Thank you. Uh, all right, moving on to board policy committee meeting of March 15th, 2023. So we met last week and we um, essentially just went through policies to make sure uh, we were acting in accordance with the recommendations made by Viola, uh, really just to make sure that the legalese was where it should be. Um, that is all outlined in um, new business. The only thing, I guess, of, of note would be that um, policies 1422, 4122, as well as 2260, 3122, um, uh, focused on making sure that we were up to date with uh, the coordinators for uh, listing the up to date names of the coordinators for non discrimination and equal opportunity and non discrimination access to equal education opportunity. That the coordinators for handling that in the district were updated as the names um, previously listed were no longer employees. We have an outstanding question. We're looking for clarification um, for another policy, so we didn't include that in the first reading. It was regarding uh, building visitors and we just want to make sure that we get all our ducks in a row on that before we even go through a first meeting. That's all I have. Is there anything else? We were there. Uh, a lot of our folks were sick, so I don't know if there's anything else. Thank you. Uh, we do not have our student school board representatives, so we will move on to new business. Um, the first is the NEOLA policies for a first reading. Um, Mrs. Clip just went over that. Uh, do you have anything further? 
I don't. Okay. And then we don't take any action on those tonight. Okay. All right, um, moving on to 9B, consider adoption of the 2023-2024 school calendar. Um, Mr. Sedgwick, do you have any comments on that? So, nothing prepared, but some noteworthy items. Uh, looking at another post-Labor Day start, so the day after Labor Day again this year a longer winter break by a few days a longer spring break by one or two days and observing martin luther king day and president's day so there would be no school on those days and then we would be ending a little bit later than normal to accommodate those extra breaks but that pretty much sums it up all right, thank you. So I would entertain a motion to consider the adoption of the 2023-2024 school calendar. I make a motion to adopt the 2023 and 2024 school calendar. I'll second. All right, motion made by Ms. Ray, seconded by Mrs. Clip. Um, is there any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes. All right, consider awarding the audit services bid to Anderson, Packman and Company, PLC. Do we have any further information for that? Or? Okay. Uh, the one comment I guess I would make is um, Marisa did competitively bid this. Uh, we had one bid come back. Uh, however, um, in regards to price, uh, the audit firm that we used last year, uh, the bid price was $28,900. The first year under this bid is $24,000. So we'd see approximately $5,000 worth of upfront savings under this proposal. So I think that's important to note. I'd also add that one of the benefits of working with Anderson, Tackman and Company is that they are local yes. and would be working with us in person instead of remotely and I thought that was an important feature. I, I completely agree with that. Um, it is a local firm, they pay local taxes, the families go to the district, so um, it would be keeping our tax dollars here in the community. I'll make a recommendation to accept the proposal for Anderson Techman uh, for audit services. All right, motion made by Mr. Hewitt. Support. Support by Ms. Ray. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes. All right, and then we added 9D, staff appreciation. Um, would you have to introduce yourself? Yeah, okay. Um, so, any further discussion on that? I don't have anything to add, uh, unless the board has questions for me. Okay. All right, then I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the staff appreciation as um, presented by Mr. Sedgwick. I'll make a motion to uh, entertain the staff appreciation stipend as staff appreciation as presented by Superintendent Assembly. All right, and support by Ms. Wright. And I will be abstaining. Okay, Mr. Hugh will be abstaining. All right, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And we have one abstention. Uh, anyone opposed? All right, motion passes. Okay, moving on to comments from the public general. All right, we'll start our list over again. All right, uh, Laura Lee Brody, please. Oh. 
just a reminder that it's a five minute yeah. limit. Okay. Yep. Um, my name is Laura Lee Brody. Um, I live in Trowbridge, 2500 Badger Street. And I'm speaking as a parent of a child with special needs. Um, first, I want to say I am so proud that my children attend the Marquette schools. I know that each one of you, as you sit on this board, have the fire inside of you to make a positive impact on our children's education and future. And for that, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. The early childhood special education program was a blessing to us in a time when we were in great worry and stress about our next step would be for our son who could not possibly enter a typical preschool setting. My son Lawson has autism. He has, a para, he has had a parapro since entering Marquette Public Schools. Lawson is in a mainstream class but requires lots of attention as he is an eloper, struggles with focus, needs help with socialization and play, and has some newly found struggles with behaviors. Lawson's current aid is amazing. She uses her own personal time to research autism. She Googles how to help him with his struggles. She makes her own laminated visual aids that work for him. She watches him like glue. She has a fanny pack filled with homemade tools. She goes above and beyond, not for the money, but for the true desire of just helping my sweet boy. She deserves more. And she is just one of many, many parapros who go above and beyond every single day, tirelessly and selflessly. They deserve more. My Lawson could not speak or communicate until a few years ago. So his emotions and behaviors that he should have gone through at age two or three are happening now while he is 80 pounds and an 80 pound 10 year old boy. He simply cannot regulate his emotions and body Therefore, he is hitting, kicking, throwing objects towards his aid. She still does it, her job with the most patience and love. It is admirable and amazing to see. They deserve more. When Lawson has a day when his aid is not with him and she needs a sub, sometimes I choose not to send him that day, knowing that his day will be tough because of the lack of training. This is a key factor. It is typical for him to need routine, but adding someone who is not trained to know him to fill in as a sub makes for a very rough day for him, his teachers and his peers. The importance of passing information on to a substitute who are with our children that day is so, so important. I know you, have made the, I know you may have heard this spiel before, but I am pleading with you to please, please, please help us take action to make some improvements that will make your staff's job easier, make th this position more appealing to qualified and exceptional people, less staff turnover, and more importantly, to give these amazing students what they deserve, which is to be properly understood and educated. Honestly, please think about it. Would you still stay at a job where you are underpaid with no summer pay, had very little training, and sometimes took verbal and physical abuse? And on the other side of it, would you want your child in a school that didn't take proper steps to allow your child to be understood? To know the person working directly with them has absolutely no training on what may help them? I know and hope that each one of you can find it in your loving hearts to at least listen, think, and move forward on making a plan together. So for that, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Shilpa. Jobalia. Um, good evening, my name is Shilpa Jobalia and I live at 1085 Woodridge Avenue in Marquette Township. I'm here today not in my professional role as a parent liaison, but as a concerned community member and parent of children enrolled in Marquette Area Public Schools. One of my kids has an IEP and cannot speak for herself. So I am using my voice today to bring awareness to some major problems facing our most vulnerable student population, students with special needs. I believe many of these students are dealing with frequent disruption to their education due in large part to the difficulty recruiting and retaining paraprofessional staff. Let me start by saying I deeply respect the labor of paraprofessional staff and I'm very familiar with the value parapros bring to schools. 
My mother was a parapro for 23 years. My child works daily with a parapro, and many parapros are peers and fellow parents. Parapros perform a critical role for students with special needs as they provide instructional, behavioral, and other support to students both inside and outside the classroom. Teachers rely on them for their support that they provide in order to teach students the curriculum they are entitled to learn. It has come to my attention that MAPS is facing a high turnover rate for this high stress, labor intensive job, which leads to staffing shortages. This results in parapro staff being shuffled around the building to fill in other positions such as noon hour supervisor. This also means that subs are being brought in to work with students with special needs with little to no familiarity or training on that particular student's special needs. With all of this upheaval, teachers cannot effectively teach and students cannot effectively learn. Why are we unable to recruit and retain high quality paraprofessional staff? I believe the first reason is low wages. MAPS compensates paraprofessional staff starting at $11.50 an hour. This is almost $2 lower than Gwyn Area Public Schools that pay their parapro staff starting at $13.33. With the rising cost of food, housing, transportation, and childcare, I think we can all agree that $11.50 is not a livable wage. Combined with the fact that parapro staff largely do not get compensated for spring break, winter break, and summer break, how can we expect to fill this valuable position that our students with special needs qualify for and are legally entitled to in their IEP? There is also a severe lack of orientation and training for parapros. Unfortunately, it appears that training on specific disorders such as autism and sensory processing disorder is neither consistent across buildings nor being prioritized. Often, a new parapro hire is thrown into a sink or swim situation forced to do extra research in their own time about specific needs. Other areas of training that do not appear prioritized are things like EpiPen, CPR, and first aid. The inability or unwillingness to share IEPs and behavior plans with parapros and subs who are moved around so regularly contributes to a sink or swim environment. If a student's needs are not understood and met, this can lead to major behavioral issues and emotional turmoil that can be damaging and disruptive not only to the student but the teacher in the entire classroom. An improved communication system is in order. <clears throat> Prior to my children entering the public school system, I was advocating for child care reform in our community. In the past few years, the lack of affordable, available, high quality child care has severely impacted our families. The paraprofessional staff shortage and high turnover rate is an offshoot of the child care crisis. Parapros are often parents themselves. Many are single mothers who have no child care solutions. They do not have the option to find extra work outside of school hours. In sum, I am asking the school board and MAPS administration to increase the wages of parapro staff to a livable wage competitive with other Marquette education centers paying a minimum of $15 an hour. Revamp training policies and foster open, safe dialogue with your parapros and teachers. Make IEP and behavior plans easily accessible to parapro and sub aid staff. And lastly, work collaboratively with parents like myself, community members, and staff to find creative solutions to these problems. This is not an us versus them scenario. We are all fighting for educators, education, and our beloved students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan Kilpola. Dan Kilblood, 1027 Second Street, Marquette. Uh, I'm a Gwynn High School teacher, and until this year, I didn't realize how crucial Parapro was in my classroom. Uh, I don't know if it's just the year or this group of freshmen, uh, or two years of COVID, but the behavior issues I feel like are like I've never seen in my career yet th thus far. Um, just having another set of eyes in the room 
and being able to deal with, this, with the issues discreetly as possible with a pair. I can take a student in the hallway and the room's not gonna blow up behind me. Um, students having another adult to turn to, if they're not having the greatest time with me in algebra that day or physics, they can talk to someone else and someone else can bring them back up to speed or just calm those nerves or those uh, stresses that are present at the moment. I'm just one person and the needs are frequent and numerous and obviously accommodating students' special needs is a big, uh, I would say maybe the most important role as a para. And so I value them, they're, they're worth every penny that we pay them, for sure. Just dealing with the regular classroom interruptions and having another adult in the room to steer the ship back um, has helped me immensely as a teacher. In Gwynn, we've been fortunate to keep most of our paraphros this year, uh, not all of them. <coughs> and hiring new ones has been incredibly challenging, as I'm sure Maps is familiar with so, uh, staffage shortages. It seems like everyone is dealing with that these days. I believe keeping current teachers just in education right now is an ongoing challenge. I know personally, teachers that are well into their career, and I would say, why aren't you just going to stick it out and retire? You've got it, and they're going in a different direction. Um, I think it's financial. I don't know if it's all that. I think some teacher burnout is playing into it. So I feel like investing and fairly compensating pair pros is one way to meet that ongoing challenge and invest in our future. They are, yeah, they do a thankless job. Um, sometimes, and sometimes they are thanked. And I, I just believe that, and I just saw that the, I could pick many examples of wages, um, and I'm not here to, I'm not an ex expert on finances and what the budgets are and everything, but I just mm -hmm. feel like if the Fish Express is hiring at 17 bucks an hour, um, maybe it's time that we, as a district, think about overpaying our fair price as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gwen Storm. Storm. I also live at 1027 Second Street. I'm a mother of two and a social worker and also a mental health therapist here in Marquette. I'm here tonight to support the work of teachers and pro <clears throat> tonight to support uh, and advocate for teachers and para pros in the Marquette School District. I want to start by expressing my deep gratitude for the excellent experience my daughter Marion, who's here at her first uh, board meeting tonight. <laughs> that she's experienced this year in Ms. Murtha's kindergarten class at Graver Elementary School. Uh, on, top of value, <clears throat> on top of the value of mastering content like reading, writing, and math, uh, our daughter and her classmates have greatly benefited from Ms. Murtha's kindness, leadership, and competency, and also the other staff members at Graver. We just had a wonderful experience. Um, makes us feel happy to send her there. Uh, as a therapist and a mother, I have seen the toll that today's challenges have placed on families, children, and our community. Increased isolation, mental illness, addiction, housing and childcare that are not available or affordable, inflation, staffing shortages, and the lingering effects of COVID um, that we kind of talked about tonight. These challenges at time make you wonder, as I was recently reminded when I went to the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, how we are going to make something out of nothing. I feel like that's what parents are being asked to do, that's what school boards and schools are being asked to do to make something out of nothing. It feels like you, know, you already have a five million dollar shortfall um, and you're being asked to do more. How is that possible? And that's, as parents, we, we face the same thing. Um, my husband and sister have been uh, teaching in the public schools for 20 years and I've witnessed firsthand the often crushing emotional and behavioral management load that teachers take on in addition to educating students. Um, me, I sit with one person as a therapist and my husband has 25 children who he is managing teaching in addition to therapy <laughs> in his own way. So um, the additional stress was a major factor in leading to my sister leaving the classroom this year. Just actually her last day was Friday. It's well documented that humans require safety as a foundation for all other growth. 
when we are exposed to emotions and behaviors from our children or students that we're not prepared or supported to deal with, we can sometimes inadvertently contribute or exacerbate the problems, making it harder for ourselves, for the classroom, uh, for families. It just kind of has a trickle-down effect if we don't have the support that we need. Uh, although I'm encouraged to hear about the proposed plans to allow teachers and parapros the option to seek their own additional training, um, this doesn't seem sufficient or, or like a proactive way to ensure that those who deal with the highest needs students are adequately prepared for the job. Um, I know that in, in my own work as a social worker, I get training in where I can, but certainly when it's included as part of my job, I'm much more likely to follow through with it, do with it do it and, and be prepared. <clears throat> Parapros who receive very limited training uh, and limited support during their job place themselves, our school district, and our children at risk. It's my hope that the board would hear the concerns tonight, not as parents and staff, I'm grateful for the enormous effort it takes to run a school district, uh, but as an opportunity to hear and address the real concerns to make our school safer and healthier for students, parapros, teachers, and our community. I look forward to seeing the steps that we can take to provide adequate and fair compensation, to retain and reward parapros for the value they provide for students, families, and teachers. Additionally, I'm hopeful that our leaders will acknowledge and respond to the need for training and a reliable system to share child-specific needs with substitute staff. Thank you so much for your attention and your time and um, for doing your tireless work to contribute to our community and our school. Thank you. Um, Emily Richards. Hi, my name is Emily Richards. Um, I reside at 401 South Lakeshore Boulevard in Little Marquette Place. Um, I was a paraprofessional in the Functional Skills Program classroom and substitute teacher at San Diego from January 2021 to June of 2022. Um, this was my first job after graduating from NMU with my bachelor's in psychology and neuroscience. I was beyond excited to have been placed in functional skills of my zone as the FSP classroom. I've always had an interest and a passion um, for working with children, especially children with developmental disabilities. Um, being able to make a positive difference in the lives of students and witnessing their breakthrough moments was incredibly rewarding. My experience at Sandy Knoll inspired me to continue my education and pursue my master's in school counseling, which I'm currently doing through Grand Valley State University. I also continue to work with individuals with developmental disabilities and mental illnesses outside of the school system as a mental health care clinician um, in Marquette. Um, I remember my first day at Sandy Knoll. It was like yesterday. Um, I was working in the um, FST classroom and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Uh, my training solely consisted of observing the teacher and other paraprofessionals working with the children directly. It took months for me to feel comfortable coming to work every day. I was not offered any professional development or any professional training until um, Handle with Care, seven months after I started. Um, Handle with Care involved learning crisis intervention and physical restraint techniques, and still this training did not prepare me to manage and de-escalate de a range of challenging behaviors within the classroom. These challenging behaviors included being hit, kicked, scratched, and pinched by the students every single day. These behaviors are disruptive, aggressive, and self-destructive. It would be beneficial for teachers and paraprofessionals to receive extensive behavior management training from behavior analysts or child psychologists. Behavior management training would contribute to the success of all staff and all students. This training would reduce staff and student injury as well. Two of my fingers were severely sprained by a student. I also have a permanent scar on my face from getting scratched. Um, I witnessed my team getting physically assaulted and verbally assaulted by the children in FSP on a daily basis. It would be beneficial to have a class or training to develop a working knowledge and understanding of developmental disabilities, high medical needs of students, and the autism spectrum. The diagnostic, the, the diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder applies to many students in special education, especially in FSP. Although these students might have the same diagnosis, they're all very unique with different needs. It takes time to get to know them and understand their behaviors. It would also be beneficial to have all teachers and paraprofessionals be CPR and first aid certified. I was only, the only one in FSP with training in CPR and first aid due to my background as a beach lifeguard on Lake Michigan. Um, 
and that came in handy quite a few times. I was surprised this was not a mandatory training to begin with. Although my job was very fun and rewarding, um, overall, it was very physically and emotionally draining for the teachers and all of the paraprofessionals involved. I believe paraprofessionals should be paid more to, due to the challenging nature and the high needs of the students, especially in the FSP classroom. The risk of staff injury is also higher in comparison to the general education classrooms. And with that being said, the FSP team is incredible. I am so blessed to be friends with them and have worked with the most strong and compassionate women um, I've ever been around. They're incredible. Um, they truly care about students and the school is so lucky to have them still to this day. Um, I'm also forever thankful to the students. Uh, they will continue to inspire me to be a better person. And I'm very, very, very thankful for my experience at Sandy Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa McBride. Lisa McBride, 9 to 3 and a half Wilson, Marquette. I'm here to talk about some high school problems that have gone on too long. I've been a single mom for 18 years, and the last few months there's been this behind the scenes stuff that are not okay. It began last year actually, and I wish I would have been at these meetings last school year. When the principal told my daughter at a 504, so it's fitting with the topic discussed. When the principal told my daughter and I, oh, the teacher says she's a great student, therefore no accommodation is needed, end quote. This year, the new therapist in the fall, and instead of focusing on the, um, the teenage troubles and my daughter's ADHD and anxiety and helping with that. My daughter was told, you are grieving the loss of a mother even though she is alive. And she barely knew my kid, and I've been 18 years into this, and that's not okay either. That just set the tone for just not, just ridiculousness. Furthermore, um, there's a librarian who is playing God, guardian, and wannabe counselor yet was advised by multiple agencies to back off and was informed that there's nothing ex uh, extreme. I have never had, I've parented for 18 years and nothing has been taken away from me. I have full physical everything all these years. I have raised a respectable kid as involved as am I in the community. And then there's the office worker who I can't even walk into the school as recently as February 27th, mine and my daughter's birthday, which also was a meeting I almost desperately went to that one. I can't even walk into the high school all of a sudden without an alert going out. And from an office worker, and notifying a staff who then notifies more staff of my presence in there. And it wasn't just because of the birthday. The librarian is aware of my daughter's medical things my daughter has had 12 plus surgeries in 10 years. My daughter also has ADHD and anxiety. Why would a staff member then tell my teenager with a recent surgery, did she already know about the surgery but had not told you? When did you have your last test x-rays to diagnose those tumors? I am convinced she is not well. Does this surgery have to be done right now? Doubt it. 
Did she go seeking a way to cause you pain, grief, and fear the best way she knows to? Wonder if she's getting pleasure out of creating extra chaos for you. Abusers take pleasure in causing disruptions and surprises that frighten us. Cancel, cancel her evilness. End quote. You can't be in trouble because of her bad parenting, which is what's creating a constantly tense and toxic situation all the time. Anybody who talks with Lisa or listens to her can tell her own mental health issues are part of her bad parenting. She keeps trying to trigger you and worsen your emotions. She will push you to go to the psych ward in Wisconsin, and then you will be fighting for adult to be free. It smells to me of Lisa trying to scare or intimidate you. This person is also behind on getting my daughter to remove me from medical things locally and at U of M. And again, there has been no, I have not had anything removed from me except in the school walls where there's a whole lot of corrupt crap going on at the high school. And why would I go to them um, with what I just outlined? Everything from the principal's lack of support, the therapist whose game plan is not what it should be, and the librarian who is going around orders from agencies that um, I am not, that, and trying to remove me from my own daughter's life. And the office worker who gave a heads up, but not for the right reasons. This person was warned to not um, do further things outside of school, but continued to lie and sneak around the school. And this person, Millie White, needs to be removed uh, from the school and her job terminated due to um, continued tactics, as well as getting um, uh, my daughter into an agency, Lutheran Social Services, which no agency ever told. Lutheran Social Services is, is giving my daughter is for at risk and homeless people. Uh, thank you. Um, moving on to board member comments. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Zadudnik. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, school principal for uh, your time in the uh, tour going through it. It's been a while since I was a uh, proud graduate, uh, San Diego Explorer. Uh, it's been a few years. Um, so, uh, and I also do appreciate the comments. Um, and information uh, regarding the uh, parapro uh, and instructional aid uh, positions um, here. So uh, just understand that those are, those are being heard. Uh, Ms. Ray. I mean, clearly, as we had a great presentation, thank you, um, and that there's a, a deep need here, and we know it's starts in our schools, but it's everywhere. Um, and that we are post-COVID. Uh, when I look at the numbers and I look at, you know, we've gone from 14.88% over five years to 17.06%. And that's actually, when you look at the numbers, it's a 15% increase in the numbers from 504 to 576. That's significant. And, you know, we are all struggling here to try to manage what, um, each individual is contending with. Uh, I appreciate, and I, we do hear you, and we are, I appreciate the um, presentation and the staff appreciation pieces, and um, we're, we're listening, we are. And thank you for coming, mm -hmm. all of you. Mrs. Clip. Thank you, Mrs. Brock, and um, all of the San Diego, <coughs> excuse me, the Sandy Knoll staff for um, your presentation. It's super fun to walk around and see what kids are doing and to see what the adults are thinking about what the kids are doing. So that's the teacher in me, and I appreciate that. Uh, and just to echo um, what everybody else has said so far, this is why we ran for this position, and, and I think this is probably why we got elected, is to listen. So. We are listening. Thank you. Mr. Hewitt. 
sound like a broken record. Just want to say thank you to everybody here at St. Nolf and uh, also Ms. Johnson uh, for the presentation about um, special education in the district. So, thanks. All right, uh, board president comments. Um, I'd just like to thank Sandy Knoll for having us. Uh, it's always a pleasure to go check out the different schools and just kind of hear what's going on in the buildings. Um, and I would like to thank the parents and everyone for coming out. We appreciate your, your comments. Um, <coughs> I don't know, I, that's about it. Um, for those of you that I am excited about the school calendar because uh, for those of you that have kids in the district, um, this year's Christmas break was a little bit short and I'm definitely happy to, to see it a little bit longer break because the winter time is when I usually need one. <laughs> um, so that's about it. Uh, let's see, announcements and other meetings. March 21st, Spotlight on the Arts, which would be tomorrow in the high school gym. Uh, at 6.30, the end of the third quarter, March 24th, spring break, March 27th through the 31st. Uh, April 5th is the MSHS Academic Awards and the National Honor Society induction in the Barb Krill Gym at 6.30. Uh, April 7th, holiday, no school. April 17th, regular board meeting uh, back at the high school library at 5.30. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Review it. Uh, support? Support. All right. Motion made by Mr. Hewitt. Support by Ms. Ray. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you.